Thank you all for coming. Uh, we are going to talk about creditors' rights and bankruptcy. Uh, it's an area I've been practicing in for about 30 years. Uh, actually, 32. The first 30 were in Los Angeles, and we moved our family up here two years ago. And uh, we love it. We're not going back. Uh, and you won't be surprised to hear that the issues that creditors have in Nevada County are no different than the ones in a big city. Uh, and let me just ask for a show of hands. Uh, I know there are a couple of lawyers in the room, but just in general, how many of you have uncollected debts right now? You're owed money by somebody and you haven't been able to collect it. Well, that's about half. How many of you at some point in time have had to take some sort of action to collect a debt, whether it's hiring a lawyer, filing a lawsuit? Okay, if you keep your hands up for a moment, how many of you think the system is biased in favor of the debtor? Well, that's all of you, okay. Okay, well, in many ways that's true. Uh, it's true for a lot of reasons, most of them historical. Uh, there is a, a, a public policy under our legal system that everybody gets a day in court and everybody gets due process of law. And no matter how miserable, dishonest, uh, otherwise nefarious your debtor might be, he comes into court on day one with a clean slate. And the judge or the jury or whoever is hearing your case uh, weighs the evidence and makes a decision. And then when you get your judgment, you're probably going to have a difficult time enforcing it anyway. Uh, now, with this context, we all know that there are lots of programs, lots of seminars that teach people how to, they don't say hide their, your assets, they say protect your assets, right? Uh, we had a case where uh, a debtor had taken money that was owed to my client and put it into a partnership which owned a majority interest in a corporation, which owned a majority interest in a corporation, which went into bankruptcy. And we had to just peel back layer after layer after layer to get to this stuff. And unless you're owed a lot of money or you have a lot of money to spend on lawyers, uh, I think what people hope is you're going to give up and go away. So anyway, there, there are seminars, books uh, on how to go bankrupt, how to shield your assets. There isn't a lot of help out there offered to creditors. And as one of my uh, former law partners once said, creditors are people too. And it's true. I mean, sometimes when I represent creditors, I feel like I'm representing uh, a murderer or a death penalty defendant. And there is that, that little stigma in some people's eyes. It's not really fair. Creditors are people like you who own small businesses, uh, pe landlords, people who have sold merchandise they haven't been paid for, uh, people who are credit managers or collection managers for small, medium, or large companies. And their livelihoods all depend <coughs> to some degree on how well they can do their job and how well they can collect their debts. So what we're going to try to do in the next 50 or 55 minutes is a very quick survey of some of the legal provisions relevant to creditors' rights, suing to collect a debt, and what you do in the event your debtor goes bankrupt. We can't cover it all in an hour. Uh, there is a set of materials that goes into a little more detail. Um, but let's give it a shot. We're going to try to cover 10 points in the time that we've got. And I'll stick around for questions if people have, have questions. Um, and it, it, we're going to roughly follow the, the outline that you got. Uh, and topic one is, if you sue, consider prejudgment relief. But let's back up a little bit. And, let me just stress the importance of the first question, which really ought to be, should I sue? Should I file a lawsuit? Should I take some other kind of action to, uh, to collect my debts? Uh, some of you may have seen my every other weekly business law column in the union. Next Tuesday's column is about that subject. Uh, how do you decide when to sue or when to do something else? We're going to assume today that you've, you're past the point of begging or pleading or writing letters and you're going to have to take some legal action. So part of the decision on, on how to sue, whether to sue is, is is your case one in which there might be an opportunity to get what, what, what's called prejudgment relief? I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concept, but uh, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is if you file a lawsuit, you're going to wait and go to trial in a year or two and hope for the best. In a lot of cases, there are things you can do a lot sooner than that. Uh, for example, uh, if your debtor has property and you're concerned it's going to be transferred and your debt is based on a contract, uh, and you can come up with the a liquidated amount that's owed, it's not vague or speculative, uh, you can get what's called a prejudgment attachment. Uh, what an attachment does is it puts a lien on all the property you can find of your debtor, and then you can go to trial whenever you go to trial knowing that the debtor cannot transfer that property without dealing with your lien. And if you get a judgment against the debtor, uh, 
it relates back to the date of your lien. So if, for example, you attach a house and there are two deeds of trust ahead of you, and as you're proceeding with your lawsuit, the debtor puts six, seven, eight more deeds of trust on it, if you get your judgment and you had an attachment, it's going to relate back and you're going to jump over all of the people who had subsequent deeds of trust. Uh, writ of possession, it's also called a claim and delivery. If somebody has merchandise that belongs to you or goods that belong to you, or if you're a merchant and you've got a UCC security interest in merchandise and your debtor isn't paying, you can get an order and go pick it up. That's claim and delivery. So if, if those kinds of things fit the facts of your case, then it's, it's more likely that you'll benefit from filing a lawsuit. The other thing is if you get one of these kinds of relief, sometimes it brings the debtor down pretty quickly and they'll come to the table and, and get real. Uh, for example, one of the other things that you can think about is getting a receiver. How many of you are even familiar with that concept of receivership? Uh, uh, a receiver can be appointed to take over a business if it's insolvent, if there's fraud, uh, to collect money. Uh, there's a device that's kind of neat called a till tap. Uh, if a business owes you money and won't pay, uh, if it's enough money to justify attorney's fees and court fees, uh, get a receiver appointed to send somebody in to literally, it's called uh, tapping the till, take the money out of the cash register as it comes in. And uh, a friend of mine who's, who practices law in L.A. represented a landlord uh, that was owed money by a business that everybody knew was actually a house of prostitution. So when he got his receiver appointed and a uniformed sheriff came into the business to collect the money from the customers, things changed very quickly. <laughs> Uh, how many of you know what a list pendens is? Uh, it's a notice of pending action, but historically it was called a list pendens because lawyers like to use Latin terms so that no one else will understand them. Uh, a list pendens is something that you can record against real property if you have an interest in it. So if, uh, if there's a boundary dispute, something like that, and you need to sue, uh, you can lien the property by way of what's this, this list pendens. And another form of prejudgment relief is an injunction. Um, if, you're going, if you need to sue somebody for something that is not really compensable in damages, in other words, something's about to happen that's going to be irreparable, get an injunction or a temporary restraining order. So in short, if any of those kinds of things are, are present in your case, it's, it's more likely you're going to want to sue rather than go to some other form of, of self-help, mediation, arbitration, et cetera. Uh, point two, if you sue and win, uh, perfect, protect, and renew your judgment and lien. I've had lots of cases where clients have come to me to collect a judgment, and the original judgment is still sitting in their file, and they haven't done anything to, quote, perfect the judgment. Uh, and I, I think maybe it's just human nature that if you go all the way to trial and get a judgment against somebody, everybody says, we won, let's breathe a sigh of relief and go on about our other business that we have, have not been able to attend to because of this darn court case. Well. If you get a judgment, you've got to have a means for enforcing it. And, and that requires that it be perfected. And what does that mean? In the case of real property, it means you get the court to issue what's called an abstract of judgment. And you get one for every county where you think your judgment debtor has any property. And you record it with the county recorder. And uh, if it's personal property, it's not that easy to get a lien on it. Uh, if it's, if it's goods of a merchant, UCC-type property, you can. There's a thing called a Notice of Judgment Lien you can file with the Secretary of State. Uh, and when you get to that point, talk to a lawyer. Uh, you, you can figure it out, but lawyers do this stuff all the time. A Notice of Judgment Lien is good for five years. Um, a, an abstract of judgment is good for as long as a judgment is good. A judgment is good for 10 years. But a judgment can be amended and renewed. Uh, how many of you hold a judgment against somebody right now? A fair number. Uh, judgments can be renewed every 10 years, but you don't have to wait 10 years. If you renew it after five, six, seven years, there's an advantage to you, and that is uh, you can, in effect, get compound interest because the renewed judgment is in the amount of the old judgment plus the interest, and it starts to bear interest for another 10 years. <laughs> so just a little tip there. Uh, if you get a judgment, you can uh, haul in the judgment debtor even if it's a company, they have to designate somebody. So whether it's an individual or a company, haul them in for what's called a judgment debtor exam. It's usually done at the courthouse. Uh, you can have a court reporter if you want to pay for it and ask the debtor questions about his or her assets. Uh, 
subpoena documents, bank records, cancel checks, whatever you think might be relevant to collecting your judgment. Uh, and you can do it every 120 days. And if you serve your judgment debtor with a notice of a judgment debtor exam, you've got a one-year lien on all his assets. So if any assets are transferred, uh, they come back to you. So that not only can you get information from your judgment debtor by doing a judgment debtor exam, but you can pick up a lien. The lien's good for a year, but you know when the year is up, do another judgment debtor exam. Extend the lien for another year. Um, there are also a, a bunch of, of what we call secret liens uh, that you need to know about, although it's not always easy to find out what they are, and it's kind of beyond the scope of this, but uh, in the course of deciding whether to sue somebody, think about whether the judgment, if you get it, is going to be collectible at the end of the day. Uh, lawyers have common law liens. There are liens for agricultural products, liens for dry cleaning debts, all kinds of things. We, we once, uh, for the State Bar, compiled a list of them. The list was, I think, 24 pages long, double-spaced. There are federal ones and there are state ones. So again, you may collect a judgment and find that there are a lot of liens already ahead of you. The one that's usually ahead of you is either an IRS lien uh, or a deed of trust on a house. Uh, one of my clients is trying to collect money from a bankrupt debtor who gave her a deed of trust on his house. She didn't know it was a seventh trustee. There's an awful lot of people waiting in line ahead of her, unfortunately. Uh, point number three, don't overlook small claims court. Uh, the small claims court jurisdiction has been raised to $7,500. If you are an individual, it's still $5,000 if you are a business entity. So if you're owed $8,500, $12,000, you might want to waive everything in excess of the $7,500 just because small claims court is so quick and effective. So consider that. It, it, um, you can only sue twice in small claims court in any calendar year uh, if you're suing for more than $2,500. Uh, and I think that provision was enacted to, to stop institutional type uh, plaintiffs, companies, banks, from using small claims court as a mill, and taking advantage of it and clogging up the system. Uh, but it can be effective. Uh, what you have to keep in mind, though, is you're probably going to get a judge pro tem who is not a judge of the superior court, but <laughs> is a lawyer who's a volunteer. So you're kind of betting on the lawyer uh, either knowing the law or being willing to listen or learn the law. Uh, normally these people are, are fine. But if you lose as the plaintiff, you cannot appeal. Only a defendant can appeal in small claims court. So th that's the downside, but, but normally it's quick, it's inexpensive, and the clerk's office here will be very helpful if you have questions about the small claims process. And uh, nobody can be represented by a lawyer. And uh, my wife and I had to, had to sue a uh, hit-and-run driver in L.A. once. I don't like to sue in my spare time, but we had to do it. Uh, and because I'm a lawyer, uh, uh, the, the, the judge pro tem declined to hear the case and had us go to a real judge. So that happens. So if you're a lawyer, you can still go to small claims court, but it might not be so quick and easy. Uh, and don't overlook alternative dispute resolution processes. Again, it's kind of beyond the scope of what we're doing today. We don't have time to talk about it much. But there's a great mediation program here in the county. Uh, and uh, there is also arbitration. The difference between them is an arbitrator. These are both informal out-of-court proceedings. And they're cheaper than litigation. But an arbitrator makes a decision. A mediator has no power to make a decision, but helps the parties reach a resolution. So mediation only works if the parties uh, are motivated. There are a lot of contracts now that require mediation. Uh, for example, if you've bought a house recently, uh, your, your standard real estate contract probably requires that any dispute be mediated before you sue your seller. And if you don't mediate, you can't recover your attorney's fees if you sue and win. So always look at the fine print. Uh, and I don't even think that's waivable. I'm not sure. But mo I think the standard contracts pretty much provide for that now. Uh, a lot of businesses that you deal with will uh, include in their fine print a requirement for either mediation or arbitration. Uh, if you rent a car, if you go to a hospital, there may well be an arbitration requirement in the contract. Is it enforceable? Probably. Uh, how many of you know what a contract of adhesion is? Uh, it's the fine gray print, basically. It's it's the all that stuff on the back of, a, of an agreement that you're handling when you rent a car or 
do anything else when you buy anything and you're just told here would you sign this please and you sign it and if you wanted to take time to read it you'd have to go away for a couple of hours and come back well are those kinds of things unenforceable not necessarily not per se they're unenforceable if they're unconscionable and that's a judgment a court makes case by case so the fact that it's fine print and the fact you didn't have any bargaining position the fact you couldn't read it before you signed it not necessarily a defense um, so it's, it's up to the court to decide uh, if it was so onerous and so oppressive that you should be relieved of it. Bottom line is if there's an arbitration provision in a contract you signed or a mediation provision, you probably have to go through that process before you file a lawsuit. Uh, and we won't talk any more about that because we don't have time. Uh, point number four in the outline, pay attention to bankruptcy notices. And this can't be stressed enough. Uh, things can happen quickly in bankruptcy. And in theory, at least, if somebody goes bankrupt, everyone who has a claim, even if the debtor doesn't acknowledge the validity of the claim, is supposed to get notice of the bankruptcy. So if you're owed money by a company or by an individual who goes bankrupt, one of two things will happen. Either you won't get a notice at all, and the bankruptcy will go on, and you won't even know about it. And there are remedies for that. Or you'll get a notice. And any bankruptcy debtor who has good bankruptcy counsel will notice everybody in the world he can think of who he might owe a dime to. The reason for that is he wants to discharge his debts in bankruptcy, which means be relieved of them. And if he, if he hasn't given notice to you, your debt is going to survive the bankruptcy. So everybody in the world is going to get notice. Now, if your address has changed since you dealt with the debtor, for example, the notice might not get to you. Again, there are remedies. But if you get a notice, uh, first thing you do is look at what chapter the bankruptcy was filed under. And uh, real briefly, there are, well, the outline says five. There are really six chapters under which a bankruptcy can be filed. Uh, three of them you're not going to see. You're not going to see a chapter uh, nine, probably, which is a municipal bankruptcy. Orange County filed bankruptcy. The Tucson, Arizona School District filed bankruptcy, and a few others have. Uh, you're not going to see a chapter 12, probably. It's a family farmer bankruptcy. Even though there are family farmers in our area, you just don't see bankruptcies filed under 12. Uh, and you won't see a Chapter 15. It's a cross-border insolvency. A foreign national or a foreign company files a bankruptcy to, to deal with assets in the United States. So you're basically dealing with three chapters for practical purposes, 7, 11, and 13. Most bankruptcies, the overwhelming majority, are Chapter 7s. Chapter 7 is liquidation. Um, and the, the bankruptcy is filed within a matter of days a trustee is appointed to take over all the assets of the debtor that's a chapter 7 chapter 11 is a reorganization uh, that's what the big auto parts companies are doing that's what the big home lenders are doing but it's also something an individual can do not very often because it's expensive uh, there are all kinds of filing requirements accounting reports that have to be filed bi-weekly monthly bi-monthly uh, and lots and lots of attorney time. So you generally don't see it an individual Chapter 11, but for uh, a couple of high net worth individuals that our clients have dealt with who fell on hard times, they filed individual Chapter 11s. Big difference between a 7 and an 11. In an 11, the debtor continues to run his own business unless the court takes it away for fraud or other good reasons. And finally, Chapter 13. Chapter 13 is used increasingly since the passage of uh, the Bankruptcy Reform Act in 2005. Chapter 13, it used to be called a wage earner plan. It's an, it's an individual uh, reorganization, if you will. Uh, but the assets of the individual don't go to a trustee. There is a, a, a supervisory trustee for the district, but the trustee doesn't take over the assets of the debtor. And a lot of people who, who used to file Chapter 7s have to file 13s now because if you are above the threshold in terms of income and ability to pay, you can't do a 7 anymore. You have to do a 13. But you can't do a 13 if you have uh, debts over a certain amount. So there are people who can't file bankruptcy at all except Chapter 11. So that's kind of a hole they fall through under the new law. There are more Chapter 13s being filed than there used to be. Chapter 13s uh, move very, very quickly. And I can't tell you how many clients we've had call us and say, well, we had this guy file a Chapter 13, and the plan's been confirmed, and what should we do now? And all you can do now is take whatever the plan gives you, because it's too late to do anything. 
and a plan can be confirmed 30 days after the case is filed. So if you get a bankruptcy notice, take a look at it. If it's a Chapter 7 notice, it's going to say several things. It's going to say that bankruptcy has been filed. Uh, it's going to set a date for a meeting of creditors. And uh, it's probably going to say, because 90-something percent of them say this, uh, it does not appear that there are any assets available for creditors. Do not file a proof of claim unless you're notified to file one. Okay, because almost all the Chapter 7s that are filed uh, are, they're not profitable for the trustee, because the trustee gets a percentage of the assets that go through his hands, and there may not be any. Uh, and the debtor takes his exemptions. He can exempt a couple thousand dollars in a motor vehicle, I think $200 in household pets. Uh, uh, there's a homestead exemption if he's got real estate, and a few others that are laid out in the bankruptcy code and go up with the cost of living every year. Uh, and other than that, everything goes to the creditors, and if there isn't anything, there isn't anything. Uh, and again, that's 90-something percent of all bankruptcies. Uh, now, if you get that kind of a notice, that doesn't mean that you should ignore the bankruptcy. I think it's always a good idea to file what's called a request for notice. And what, you, you file it with the court. It's one or two pages. You can find the forms at any place. Uh, you can do it by hand if you need to. Uh, and it, it ensures that you get notice of anything that happens in the case. If the debtor has put you on his schedules, you're going to get notice anyway. But what if the debtor amends his schedules and takes you off? I think it's a good idea, a little bit of a belt and suspenders approach to, uh, to file the request for notice. If you get the other kind of notice in a Chapter 7 that says there may be assets and here's your date for filing a claim, then it might be worth going to the first meeting of creditors. And uh, you do get the chance to ask questions of the debtor, but uh, typically there are 30, 40, 50 of these things on calendar. And if you ask more than a couple of questions, the trustee who's running the meeting is going to say, take the debtor's deposition or take it, what's called a Rule 2004 exam. Don't take up any more time. The trustee is going to ask the debtor, what assets do you have? What assets are you going to keep? Is this your real name? Is this your real address? Not too much more than that. Um, the notice you get is also going to give you a date for objecting to discharge or dischargeability of the debtor. Now, could, could you raise your hands again if you've got unpaid debts? Uh, and keep them up if your debtor is in bankruptcy. Okay, and keep your hands up if your debt was incurred through fraud or dishonesty. Okay, well, you've got a situation then where maybe you can block the discharge of your debtor. In other words, prevent him from escaping from his debts through bankruptcy. And the, the grounds for, the, there are really kind of two species of this. One is dischargeability. If you block dischargeability, you're blocking the debtor from discharging any of his debts. Normally, you don't care about other people's debts. In fact, the more other debts get discharged, the more there's left for you. Uh, but if the debtor has lied on his schedules, lied under oath at the meeting of creditors, et cetera, uh, failed to file things he's supposed to, supposed to file, uh, dischargeability may be blocked. The other species of this is, is blocking discharge of a single debt. And that can be done if you show fraud, breach of fiduciary duty, uh, willful and malicious injury to property, that kind of thing. But there's always a deadline, and the deadline's usually a couple of months after the date set for that first meeting of creditors. And if the me meeting of creditors is postponed, that deadline may not, may not be postponed with it. So it's always a good idea to get something on file with the court uh, right away. Does this apply to Chapter 11 also? Uh, yeah, it does, although uh, the, the dates are usually set by the court and not automatically set in that notice. And the concept is different in 11 because uh, there's going to be either a reorganization plan that has to deal with every debt, dischargeable or not dischargeable, uh, or it's going to get converted to Chapter 7, and then you're going to be able to file your, your complaint. So we usually file them anyway, even though it's a little bit of a different procedure. Uh, chapter 13, the debtor doesn't get a discharge until the end of the day, the end of the day being three to five years out. The way Chapter 13 works is this. Uh, instead of a trustee taking over the assets and dispersing them if there are any to creditors, the debtor files a schedule of his income and his expenses. And the difference is disposable income. And he offers to pay his disposable income to his creditors over a period of somewhere between normally three and five years. And that plan might get a hearing 30 days after he files. If the court approves it, that's it. So if you have a basis for objecting to it, you've got to object sometime before that hearing. The basis for objection normally is, I would do better in a liquidation than I will do over this ridiculous, uh, compared to this ridiculous plan. 
uh, and the debtor doesn't get a discharge till the end of the day, so you're going to wait three to five years to block discharge. So Chapter 13 is great for a debtor if it works, but uh, if the plan proposed is not a fair plan, it's likely to get converted to a Chapter 7 anyway. Uh, if you have something other than a no asset Chapter 7, in other words, a Chapter 7 with assets or a Chapter 11 or Chapter 13, file a proof of claim. Uh, the court will normally set a deadline in a Chapter 7 right away. In a Chapter 11, the court will set a deadline somewhere down the road. Uh, I always file them right away because I don't have to wake up in the middle of the night and say, did I miss a deadline in that case? If you file it, it's filed. Uh, now, you will learn if you look in a bankruptcy textbook that if the debtor has put your claim on his schedules that he has to file, you don't have to file a proof of claim. File it anyway. File it anyway because the debtor can amend his schedules, uh, can take you off, can change the amount. And if, you've, if you have filed it, nobody can take that away from you, at least on the, on the books and records of the court. Uh, somebody may object to it, but uh, you deal with that when it happens. Uh, what else do you do at the outset of a bankruptcy case? Well, you think about uh, the automatic stay and what you can do about it. How many of you have heard of the automatic stay in bankruptcy? That really gets us into point uh, five, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. But there are grounds for objecting to and getting relief from the automatic stay, which, as, as we'll talk about in a minute, basically blocks you from suing a bankrupt person, outside of bankruptcy court at least. Uh, if there is a cause for relief from stay, the court will grant it. Cause can be you have a deed of trust on a piece of property. There's no equity in the property for the debtor, and therefore we can't possibly need it for a bankruptcy reorganization. There are lots of other grounds laid out in the, in the bankruptcy code. Uh, should you serve on a creditor's committee if there's a creditor's committee appointed? Normally there, there would only be one in a big seven or an 11. Uh, maybe. I mean, in, in, in the older times, it was an advantage to be on a creditor's committee because you would get more information and find out more readily what's going on in a bankruptcy case. Uh, especially under the 2005 Bankruptcy Reform Act, creditors have a lot of fiduciary duties to all the other creditors. So you're, you're almost in an inherent conflict of interest situation if you serve on a creditor's committee. Everything you learn that might benefit you or your client uh, you have to share with the other creditors and you have a duty to them. So is there an advantage in being on the committee? Frequently there isn't. Um, what if you are dealing with a Chapter 7 debtor who wants to continue doing business with you, who calls you up and says, well, I know I owe you $15,000. Suppose I give you this tractor and $5,000. You can't make that deal because a Chapter 7 debtor no longer owns and controls his own property. The bankruptcy trustee does. Now, who's the bankruptcy trustee? Bankruptcy trustee is appointed by the federal agency that oversees bankruptcy cases. And there is a panel of trustees uh, in, in, this is the Eastern District of California. Uh, I don't know how well the map came out in the materials, but the Eastern District of California is actually more than half the counties in the state. Uh, it's all of Northern California and a lot of Central California except for the Coastal Strip. So it, it encompasses a huge amount of territory. And there are four different branches of, of the bankruptcy court, but everything from this area gets filed in Sacramento. And there's a panel of bankruptcy trustees in Sacramento, and there are also trustees who are not on the panel, but who might get the complex case or the Chapter 11 case. Uh, a trustee can be appointed in a Chapter 11 case if there's good cause for it. Generally, it means fraud or two sets of books or Ponzi schemes, that kind of thing. Uh, but in a Chapter 7 case, there's always a trustee, and the trustee is the guy who controls the debtor. So the debtor doesn't have the power to make deals with you or stay in business or do anything unless the court lets him. The court will only let him if the trustee takes an asset and says there's no value in this asset, so I want to abandon it to the debtor. Uh, it could be a piece of equipment that is leased and the lease payments haven't been paid. Give it back. It could be a piece of equipment that was purchased but not paid for and the, then the, the, the seller has a security interest in it Debtor owes $5,000 and it's worth $500. No reason for the trustee to even bother with it. it. Gives it back to the debtor. The debtor has to deal with the leasing company. But except, except for those kinds of situations, uh, your Chapter 7 debtor can't do business with you. The trustee does. So what if you need to talk to the trustee? Uh, most trustees are pretty easy to communicate with, but a lot of them, what can you say, they're less likely than Elvis to return a phone call? 
And there's a, there's a trick to talking to a trustee. If you need to talk to a trustee, this shouldn't be on tape, but we'll do it anyway. Uh, the, you, you'll call the office of the trustee. It could be an accountant, could be a lawyer. And the person who answers the phone will say, you know, you will say, is Mr. Smith in? And, you will, and they will say, is this about a case in which he's the Chapter 7 trustee? And if you say yes, you will get an assistant, a secretary, somebody who can look at the books and records and tell you what's happening. If you really want to talk to a trustee, say, yes, but I really need to talk to the trustee. And normally you get put through to the trustee. Um, trustees are busy. They've got huge caseloads. And uh, you're not necessarily going to have a lot of time to chat with one. Uh, if you've got a complex claim, consider doing what's called, as I mentioned, a Rule 2004 exam. Uh, you ask the court in writing for permission to put the debtor under oath. You can subpoena documents from the debtor. And trustees often like this because uh, they don't have the, the resources in every case to fully explore possible fraud, uh, irregularities in books and records. So if you can examine the debtor yourself and help the trustee out, it's kind of win-win. Um, now, we talked about Chapter 13 and how quickly things can happen. Uh, again, make sure you stay in the loop. It's, I would advise you to call a lawyer if you're notified of a Chapter 13, unless your debt is really small, just to, to make sure you have in mind the deadlines, when you have to object to the plan, what happens if the plan's confirmed. We're only on number five, so we'll rush a little bit. The automatic stay, I promised to get back to. Uh, th this will sound like lawyer talk to you. The automatic stay isn't always automatic. But it usually is. Uh, what, it, what it is is a, it, it, it's a legal halt to all formal legal proceedings. And it's automatic in the sense that when a debtor files bankruptcy, uh, you cannot file a lawsuit against the debtor. You can't continue with the lawsuit. You can't call up and ask for a payment. Uh, if the debtor sends you a check, you probably can't take it. Uh, to, so to that degree, it is automatic. Uh, so you can't do transactions even with a Chapter 11 debtor that are outside the ordinary course of business. For example, if, if a debtor in Chapter 11, let's say, since there's one here nearby, is a nursery. That, maybe that's a Chapter 7. So assume it's a nursery, and the debtor remains in business and is selling plants, and you go in and buy a rose bush, well, that's perfectly fine. But if the debtor is selling his entire inventory out the back door, and you're pulling up your truck to buy it, that's not fine. That's not in the ordinary course of business. And you, you can't do that. Um, but what else can't you do? You can't create, perfect, enforce any lien. So if you spend five years working your way toward trial, enduring motion after motion filed by the defendant, beating the defendant on every motion, taking his deposition, hunting down witnesses who don't want to get served, and you finally get to trial, and you get your judgment, and the next day he files bankruptcy and you haven't filed your abstract, you're an unsecured creditor, just like everybody else he hasn't paid. So. To that degree, the automatic stay is, is pretty drastic. Um, if the debtor has something that belongs to you, can you go pick it up without his consent? I wouldn't do that. Uh, you have to have some determination by the trustee or the judge that the property doesn't belong to the debtor. If it belongs to the debtor, the automatic stay, this is Bankruptcy Code Section 362 if you want to look at it. The automatic stay says you cannot take any action to exercise control over any property of the estate. And if it turns out it was property of the estate, anything you did is retroactively null and void. What if you don't get a bankruptcy notice? You're suing somebody and going to trial and getting a judgment, and the debtor doesn't say a word to the court about being in bankruptcy. You haven't gotten notice of the bankruptcy. He just figures, and I've seen this happen, well, let's go to trial. Yes, I'm in bankruptcy, but maybe I'll win, and then I won't owe this money. And if I don't win, I've still got my bankruptcy. Well, guess what? The automatic stay precludes you from getting or executing on a judgment. So if you go to trial and get a judgment against somebody who's in bankruptcy, but you don't know about the bankruptcy and he didn't tell you about the bankruptcy, at least within the Ninth Circuit, which this part of the country is in, your judgment is void. Any action in violation of the automatic stay is void. Okay. Uh, and what, when is it not automatic? Uh, if a case has been dismissed, uh, if a bankruptcy case has been dismissed, the automatic stay, if the debtor refiles, is only good for 30 days most of the time. And if it's dismissed a second time, there may not be any automatic stay at all if there's a third bankruptcy filing. And cases do get dismissed. Uh, there are a lot of new requirements debtors have to meet, and uh, the, the consequences of not meeting them are, are pretty severe. For example, there's a requirement that any, bank, any individual bankruptcy debtor 
get credit counseling at least a day before the petition date. And there was a case out of Texas, I think there are now a few more in various parts of the country, where a debtor got credit counseling the morning of the bankruptcy. And it's not that hard to get credit counseling. You can do it online in a couple of hours. So the debtor went online, got his credit counseling, and then went down to the courthouse and filed his bankruptcy petition. And the, and the judge said, no, the code says you have to do it before the petition date. So doing it this morning wasn't good enough. You had to do it yesterday. Bankruptcy dismissed. Okay, well, the debtor can take the course again or fi file a bankruptcy petition again the next day. But it's the second time, so the automatic stay is only going to be good for 30 days. So l little pitfalls for debtors. That's kind of what the Reform Act was about. It makes it a little more difficult. Uh, we won't go into all the reasons why, but that seems to be the case. There are exceptions to the automatic stay. Again, I said it's not completely automatic. Uh, government can exercise police power. Uh, I did a program with a, a family law commissioner in, in uh, Los Angeles, and uh, I asked him, uh, what if a husband has filed for bankruptcy and he's on his way over to the wife's house and says he's going to ransack the house or destroy property or harm her? Uh, can, can any action be taken against him without violating the automatic stay? And he said, I don't care about the automatic stay. I'm going to protect the wife. And if some court wants to reverse me down the road, fine. But I think he's probably right it, that anything he does is an exercise of the, of the police power of the government. And those kinds of things, just for reasons of public safety, I mean, if a, if a bankruptcy debtor is setting a fire, you can arrest him, you know. Just, it's common sense. Uh, generally speaking, child support obligations, marital support, not subject to the automatic stay. Uh, otherwise, you would see people taking their best shot in divorce court and not getting what they want and filing bankruptcy the next day and leaving the spouse or the children uh, without means. Uh, visitation rights tax audits, those kinds of things go on bankruptcy or no bankruptcy. Uh, again, it's not completely automatic. If the debtor was involved in a small business bankruptcy within the past two years and then files another bankruptcy, no automatic stay. Uh, there was a, this whole epidemic around the country of serial bankruptcy filings. Uh, people who would go from property to property and rent it and not pay the rent and go bankrupt the bankruptcy would be dismissed as a bad faith bankruptcy. They'd go rent another property, file another bankruptcy. Same thing would go on literally for years. Uh, well, at least in, if, the, if the debtor is a small business person, he can't do that. And maybe the rationale is in a business case, there are more people likely to be hurt by the, this practice. Um, so that's another exception to the automatic stay. And there are other exceptions here and there. Uh, can you communicate with the debtor without violating the automatic stay? Yes, if you don't talk about his obligation or try to collect it. Um, and, you know, if there, there are gray areas. Can you say, gee, what are you going to do in your bankruptcy case? Are you going to pay this debt like, like an adult? That's probably over the line, but it's really very subjective. So the best practice is not to talk to the debtor about anything like that. Uh, can you make new agreements, enter into new business deals with the debtor? In a Chapter 11, if the debtor is still in control, generally yes. In a Chapter 7, no, the debtor isn't running his business anymore. The trustee is. Now, if the debtor runs a corporation and the corporation is not in bankruptcy, you can probably draw a line between the debtor and the corporation and still do business with the corporation, but just know who you're dealing with and who you're signing contracts with. Uh, what's the effect of a bankruptcy on a lawsuit that's already been filed? Well, it's frozen in place. Uh, no more proceedings. Uh, you can possibly get relief from stay from the bankruptcy judge. For example, if, if you're about to go to trial in Superior Court in a case that's been around for a long time and it's ready for trial, uh, a bankruptcy judge might say, go ahead and have your trial. You can't enforce your judgment if you get it, but the, the, bank, the state court judge knows the case, parties are ready for trial, you've spent all this money, go ahead and do it. So that happens frequently. Uh, what about an unlawful detainer case? It's stopped by the bankruptcy. So if you're a landlord, your tenant goes bankrupt in the middle of the case, well, there's not much you can do unless you've got your unlawful detainer judgment. If you've got your unlawful detainer judgment, you still can't send the sheriff in to take the property. And they probably won't do it anyway, because when the sheriff sees the word bankruptcy, they tend to say, get me a bankruptcy court order before I'll do anything. Uh, but if you've got your unlawful detainer judgment, then you can probably get the bankruptcy trustee to give you the keys. Uh, if the debtor is still on the property and refuses to leave, can you physically kick him out? No. have to get an order from the bankruptcy court to do that. Okay. Uh, 
what if your landlord goes into bankruptcy? That happens too. Still have to pay the rent. But you're paying it to the trustee if it's Chapter 7. Uh, if, if you owe money to a debtor and he's in bankruptcy but it's Chapter 7, again, as long as the, you owe money to the debtor and not an affiliate, a corporation he owns, a partnership he's in, but you owe the money to the debtor, whether it's Mr. ABC or ABC Incorporated, uh, generally you pay the trustee, but I would contact the trustee before sending all the checks. So again, if it's a Chapter 7, the debtor is technically not in business. Um, but I, I must stress, if the debtor is an individual and it's the corporation you owe the money to or vice versa, uh, make sure you know which entity it is that you owe the money to before you write the check. But if it's not a bankrupt entity, no reason why you wouldn't have to pay the money. Uh, if you have an offset, if the debtor needs to be performing services to you that he's not performing, uh, do you have to continue to make payments? No, it's not one-sided, but you might need a bankruptcy court order to do that set-off. Uh, point number six, my goodness, we'll go even faster. Uh, involuntary bankruptcy, anybody ever been involved in one? Either as a creditor or, or I, won't, I won't ask who's been a debtor. An involuntary bankruptcy is when normally three creditors get together and put a debtor into bankruptcy. Uh, and if, if the debtor is not paying his debts as they mature, uh, that's a legitimate ground for an involuntary bankruptcy. Generally speaking, don't do it. Uh, even if you get two creditors to join in with you, if the debtor can prove that he shouldn't have been put into bankruptcy, the petitioning creditors can be liable for all the damage done by the filing. So there's only, generally only one good reason to do it, and even that you have to think about. Uh, and we're getting into maybe point seven or eight here. How many of you know about a preference in bankruptcy? Um, it's called a preference because if the debtor, generally speaking, again, there are always exceptions. If a debtor pays a debt, uh, within 90 days of going bankrupt, before going bankrupt, that money comes back because the debtor doesn't have the right to prefer one creditor over another. Uh, the money comes back so that everybody gets the same pro rata share of whatever the debtor has. So if, uh, if a transfer has been made that would be a preference, and it's the 87th, 88th, 89th day after the transfer, and it's a big enough transfer, you might think about an involuntary bankruptcy to suck that property back into the estate for your benefit or for your client's benefit. Other than that, there's usually not a good reason for it. And there are some law firms that categorically will not file involuntary bankruptcies because it's so risky to do it. Um, we talked about number seven already, objections to discharge in bankruptcy. And we started to talk about preferences or fraudulent transfers, which is point eight. Uh, I've given you the basic concept of what a preference is. A fraudulent transfer uh, is, is, is something governed by either bankruptcy law or state law. The provisions are, are very similar except for the statute's limitations. Fraudulent transfer in general is a transfer of property by someone who is insolvent or is rendered insolvent by the transfer and it's done either for inadequate consideration or for the purpose of defrauding a creditor. For example, um, an individual, I can think of one that I have a judgment against, goes into bankruptcy and gives a $50,000 gift to his adult daughter uh, and then files bankruptcy. Uh, maybe files bankruptcy two years, three years later. Statute of limitations is usually four years on this. Uh, the fact that it's his daughter makes no difference. He didn't get any consideration for what he transferred. We have a case where somebody transferred a, a, the majority interest in a partnership that owns real estate to his adult daughter. Well, you can't do that when you have unpaid creditors out there. And if, you're, and if it renders you insolvent, and if you're in bankruptcy, it apparently has rendered you insolvent or you are insolvent. Um, so that's what a fraudulent transfer is. And again, it's a pretty long statute of limitations. Uh, point number nine, uh, anticipate and prepare for the bankruptcy of your customer, client, borrower, tenant. This is probably the, the most useful advice you're going to get today. Uh, Bankruptcy planning for the creditor starts at the very beginning. It starts at the, at the lowest level employee. Uh, it's easy to say this, but take it to heart. Don't let your people get behind in their payments. Generally speaking, it only makes things worse. And you know, we, we see it in, in every line of business we deal with. Uh, it, it, it's almost like talking about the, the businesses that become crooked that actually steal accounts receivable, steal money out of the cash register, 
fraudulently transfer properties, stick them in Nevada corporations, which are partners in Delaware partnerships that set up trusts in Minnesota. Most of these people, in my opinion, did not start out being crooks. They started out having a bad month. And they said, our cash flow is bad. We need to do this or that for a month. But next month, things are going to be a lot better. And we'll be able to pay you guys. The next month, things are actually worse. And some of these uh, transfers of money or thefts or Ponzi schemes are already taking place. And they tell you the same thing. I know we told you we were going to pay you this month. Give us one more month. Things are really going to get better. And then the bankruptcy is filed and the assets are gone. Generally speaking, again, there are exceptions to the rule. Police your debts. Uh, if you've got collateral out there, uh, I mean, we represented a, a, a lender that financed the inventory of a company that sold organs, and they sold them mostly to churches. And the lender has the right to come out and inspect its collateral, make sure the collateral is still there, because the way this usually works, same thing with an auto dealer, the way they finance their inventory is a company will finance their acquisition of inventory, but if they sell a car or a truck, or if this business sells an organ, they've got to pay the lender its fee for the loan. And if they, if they sell a vehicle and don't do that, or sell an organ and don't do that, it's called a sale out of trust. And the lender should be able to repossess whatever remaining inventory there is to cover the loss. Well, this lender told the debtor in advance on what day it was going to come out to inspect its collateral every month. And so the debtor would call the churches that they'd sold the organs to and say, could we borrow that organ back for a couple of days? So the lender would come out and there's all the inventory, but in fact half of it's already been sold. Uh, we represent a company that financed, it. they used to be more popular than, than they are now, rent-to-own operations. Uh, these were typically for lower-income people or people who couldn't get credit. You could rent a toaster, you could rent a TV set, you could rent a clock radio. And the lender who financed the rent-to-own company had a UCC security interest in each toaster, each radio, each whatever. Um, trouble is that when these people wouldn't pay for them, and if the rent-to-own company didn't pay the lender, it's pretty tough to go out in the field and repossess a toaster. It's not worth it. Um, each invoice that the dealer uh, generated, he was supposed to stamp payable to our client, ABC Bank. And they didn't inspect their collateral, and they didn't inspect their inventory. When they finally got out there, they found good news was every invoice was stamped payable to ABC Bank. Bad news is it was also stamped payable to DEF Bank. And there was another bank out there that said, well, wait a minute, they gave us a security interest in all their inventory. So anyway, uh, if, if somebody is uh, in trouble, not paying debts, it uh, doesn't mean you just go in and sue. That doesn't necessarily get you paid either. But it does mean you take some proactive steps. You talk to the debtor. You don't extend credit beyond what you have to extend. And there's this almost kind of depression mentality. You know, if we make them pay for their goods, they'll, they'll stop doing business with us. Well, maybe that's a good thing. You know, that's not so much legal advice as business advice, but uh, it's something to think about. Think about bankruptcy when you enter into a contract, if you are the side that gets to write the contract. Uh, try to anticipate it. Do you want to have a mediation requirement? Do you want to have an arbitration requirement? Do you want to have the debtor stipulate in advance that if he goes bankrupt, you get relief from the automatic stay? Is that enforceable? I doubt it. You see it in contracts. I don't know that it's really been tested around the country. It's probably not enforceable. Um, if you are already in a dispute with a debtor and he's going to settle with you and your debt was incurred through fraud, think about in a settlement agreement uh, having the debtor stipulate that the debt was incurred through fraud and that therefore if he goes bankrupt he doesn't get a discharge from that debt. Uh, and de what debtors will usually say or their lawyers will say, uh, I don't want to use the F word. I don't want my client to say he committed fraud. We'll stipulate to relief from stay or non-dischargeability, but we won't use the F word. Well, that's not good enough because the bankruptcy court has to determine that there was fraud. So if the debtor hasn't admitted pre-bankruptcy that there was fraud, you're going to have to try the case in the bankruptcy court and get a fraud judgment. And without going into all the details, fraud cases are really, really hard. Uh, they're hard because the defendant never says, yep, yeah, I committed fraud. So how do you prove fraudulent intent? Circumstantial evidence. And it, the, it, the, those cases are really fact intensive. That means they're expensive. Lawyers have to take depositions, line up witnesses, and try to prove circumstantially what was in the debtor's mind. So if you can get your debtor to admit fraud in a settlement agreement, you are 90% of the way there in terms of giving him a disincentive to file bankruptcy to try to get out of the debt. 
Uh, personal guarantees. Let's say you're selling merchandise to a closely held corporation, a partnership. Uh, see if you can get a personal guarantee from the CEO. Uh, if, and if the, if the entity goes bankrupt, in theory at least, uh, all things being equal, the CEO is still liable on his guarantee. And if he's personally liable, then he again has a little bit of a disincentive to put his, his entity into bankruptcy. Uh, how do you anticipate being sued for a preference? Most of you probably who have small businesses, even large businesses, uh, if you've got a, a slow paying customer, as the money comes in, you tend to apply it to the oldest invoice. That may make sense from the accounting standpoint. It doesn't help you from the preference standpoint. Because uh, if you get a, a payment that is in the ordinary course of business, that's a defense to a preference claim. For example, if you got a payment uh, that was 90 days after invoice, but it's within the 90 days before bankruptcy, well, if you had a 30-day invoice, that's probably a preference. It's a payment outside the ordinary course of business within 90 days prior to bankruptcy. But if your invoice says 90 days, it doesn't sound like a preference. It's within the ordinary course of business, and that's a defense. But let's say you've got normal 30-day terms, uh, and you've got five or six months of unpaid invoices out there, and 25 days before the bankruptcy, you get a payment. Well, theoretically, if you apply that payment to the most recent invoice, that payment's not a preference because it was paid within the ordinary course of business. Uh, if you apply it against an old invoice, it is a preference. Now, don't take that advice without talking to your accountant because there may be plenty of non-bankruptcy law reasons <laughs> to apply it to the older invoice. There may be tax reasons for doing it. But again, in the bankruptcy sense, uh, current payments are usually defensible. Old payments are not. Uh, Point 10, this is not entirely self-serving, let me explain. When bankruptcy threatens or is filed, seek legal advice where appropriate. Uh, generally speaking, the longer you wait to contact a lawyer about a matter, the more it's going to cost to undo whatever damage is done in the time that you waited. It's not always true, but especially in a, in a Chapter 13 situation where things are going to happen quickly, or Chapter 11 where there's going to be uh, a, a more comprehensive meeting of creditors, than there is in a Chapter 7, where there might be a creditors committee appointed. Uh, in a chapter, uh, chapter 11, I don't know if you've heard of the concept of a prepackaged reorganization plan, but sometimes what a company will do, and it happens more in big companies, hap happened in the Marvel Comics case, for example. Uh, a bankruptcy petition is filed, and at the same time, a proposed plan that deals with all the debts and says, well, how much is going to be paid on this kind or that kind? And it's called prepackaged because theoretically the debtor already has enough votes lined up from the creditors. I don't have time to go into how all this works, but enough votes from the creditors to uh, get the plan approved. Now the problem with Marvel Comics was there was opposition to the plan. It was pretty significant opposition, but uh, and it, it, it did get slowed down like it should have. But uh, again, things can happen very quickly, and unless you're familiar with bankruptcy, at least talk to a lawyer, make sure you know what's going on, what the deadlines are, and how quickly you have to move. Yes? Two quick sure. First is, what is a break-even point between the cost of going after the money versus what you might recover? And the second question <coughs> is, at what point is the debtor free from you coming back after them? I mean, if they file a seven, is it as soon as it's deemed clear, or is it five years or how long? Oh, those are two very good questions. Uh, to answer the second one first, a, uh, the, the debtor is free when he gets his discharge. And he's going to get his discharge if there are no uh, complaints filed to block his discharge for reasons of fraud, breach of fiduciary duty, etc. And um, even if you file that complaint, you may get a notice of discharge in the mail. And do not panic if you get one because it'll probably say, except for pending complaints to block discharge, the debtor has his discharge. It's just something that the computer spits out. But when the discharge is entered, that's it. Uh, unless you didn't have notice of the bankruptcy case, in which case you can reopen it and, uh, and try to either get the debt restored or get it dealt with in the bankruptcy. I'm sorry, the first question again was? Uh, the cost of oh, the point of okay. going after it. I mean, if it's a $5,000 debt, it's going to cost me 10000 other than Going to cost me, my time's going to cost me. Are we now talking 20,000? Yeah. 20, and one of the good things about talking to a lawyer, but you could get the same thing by talking to your spouse or your brother in law, is 
some perspective. Uh, generally speaking, f filing a legal action uh, on moral grounds rather than economic grounds doesn't pay. Uh, we've had clients do it, and you know, this is, again, read, read next Tuesday's column if, if you want to read more about this, but uh, I don't know if you know the Herman uh, comic strip, but one of my favorites was a woman talking to her lawyer and saying, if we sue him for a million dollars, won't they settle for 5000 uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, I, I never advise a client to undertake a lawsuit unless they're prepared to go all the way with it because people take irrational, stupid, pig-headed, greedy, emotional positions. Some of them don't. Uh, I'd always rather have a smart businessman and a smart lawyer on the other side of my cases. But you, you get surprises. And we went to trial in, in Malibu, of all places, for a, for a month before a jury because we couldn't settle with a guy who we thought we had dead to rights on a breach of contract and we wound up getting after that month a million dollar judgment but it cost several hundred thousand dollars in attorney's fees to get there because they fought us every step of the way so if you've got a debt that is is fairly <coughs> cut and dried uh, and let's let's make it an interesting number like fifty thousand dollars way more than you want to deal with in small claims court but do you want to go all the way to trial with it you have to try to predict a couple of things are there going to be assets at the end of the day to collect, or is everything already in a, in a trust or buried here or in the Cayman Islands or something else? Do you think you're going to be able to collect? And second, how vigorous is the defense going to be? Is this a defendant who's going to hire counsel and schedule depositions of everybody who's ever touched his product and uh, seek restraining orders and cross-complain against you? Uh, you know, it wouldn't be unheard of to sue on a $25,000 debt and have the defendant cross-complain for a million dollars for libel or slander. You have to try to predict that stuff, and it's hard to do. I wish I had a real easy answer. Generally, if the debt is under $7,500, $10,000, consider small claims court, consider mediation. You can't effectively litigate something if there's opposition uh, when the debt's that size, unless you're doing it purely to, to punish the defendant. Yeah? I put some money in a 1031 company, and they file bankruptcy. The guy who owns the company is, um, he filed 150 million total. There's about 13 other companies involved. It's in New York State. Uh -huh. There's a meeting of creditors and all that stuff. Should I be, you know, there's so many attorneys involved now. Should I be getting my own attorney? Uh, may I ask what, what is roughly the amount? 650,000. Okay. It's worth talking to bankruptcy counsel. Uh, is the company based in New York or just incorporated there and based somewhere else? It was based in San Jose, 1031 Advance. Okay. There's, there's a page of about 15 different companies that are all, you know, this way. And he lives in Florida. Mm -hmm. Do you get notices of... of uh, you know, I, there's a meeting of creditors in New York on the 27th, but there's been so many postponements and adjournments of things. You know, and I think, do I want to, you know, go to New York and get something postponed and come back with nothing? I don't know what to do. Well, it'd be cheaper to get somebody in New York, a lawyer in New York, to attend for you or give you a report on it. Um, to some extent, you can get information on the company's website. In these big cases, there's almost there's always... There's trustees there and everything. Has a trustee been appointed for the case? Do you oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, then that's a good source of information. Why don't you uh, find out from the company if you can uh, or probably on their website who the trustee's lawyer is or or call the trustee okay I talked to the trustees counsel even if you just get a paralegal in their office just find out what's going on what's going to happen in the case and uh, if you need to have counsel if you want call me I can find you somebody in New York the, the um, people said that the money was in a savings account earning about five that five percent interest and in truth, the guy pulled the money, stuck it into real estate investments, which went to hell on him. Okay. Do I have any claim for any interest that's been going on for six months? Well, it, it sounds like you might have a fraud situation. I mean, it's hard to evaluate the facts just <coughs> okay. with what you've told me, but it's, it sounds like there may be a fraud situation if representations are made that, that this prudent thing is being done with the money, and in fact, something different is being done. Uh, it, it's, it's not cut and dried if the money didn't go to his economic benefit, but there's still at least a negligence, a breach of fiduciary duty situation that's worth talking there's about. There's so many people involved, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Have you filed a proof of claim in the case? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, there are so many people involved, as you say, there's that... There's so that, many attorneys already, and I'm thinking, you know... 
Well, it's likely that the biggest fish are going to control what kind of a plan comes out of this anyway, but I would at least talk to the Trustees Council. By the way, we're, we're past time, so if anybody wants to leave, you're not being rude, but I'm happy to answer more questions if, you, if anybody has any. Uh, you mentioned earlier the Cayman Islands. Um, I have a debtor who I think simply took his money from here, uh, went to Florida on vacation, went over to Bermuda or the Bahamas, I guess, and opened a bank account over there. Um, any way, any way, say even if you have a judgment, say I have a California judgment, any way of finding out if he has an account in the Bahamas or in Bermuda or the, Cay or it's, the Caymans? It's pretty tough. Uh, the whole point of doing it is it's difficult to get that kind of information and it's a real problem. Uh, in Florida it's almost as bad. Look at OJ sitting in his house with his equity and no one can touch that either. But and they, uh, Cayman Islands is particularly tough. You, you almost have to get a detective, an investigator involved. And uh, I haven't had occasion to, to go after anything in the How Caymans. Florida banks? Are Florida banks, uh, uh, can, you serve, can, can you serve a judgment on a, Florida, a California judgment on a Florida bank? Yeah, you can. You probably have to have it registered in Florida. It would be whatever Florida law provides for. But generally, that's what you would do. And the, the case number would be assigned to it there, and you get a sheriff or the equivalent in Florida. Tell me where he moved his money, you know, Florida, the Bahamas, Caymans. How can I find out where, where he moved his money? If he says, no, I didn't move it under oath, what do you do next? Well, uh, do you have a judgment? Yes. Okay, take a judgment debtor exam, subpoena records, uh, get all of his bank. How do you know who to subpoena if he says, I didn't take any money to Florida? Well, he's got to show you what happened to his money. He's got to show you all of his bank statements. The big loophole here is if he says, I don't have any bank accounts, unless you can get an investigator to find them, you can't do anything. You, you are stuck with what he says under oath unless you can independently show that he's lying. And once you do that, he's got other problems. But uh, it, it's a well, problem. Well, you have a bank account that he just doesn't talk, talk about. And uh, mm -hmm. you have to find an investigator who can find that bank account. Yeah. How does, the, how does an investigator find that bank account? Uh, when I've asked investigators that question in the past, they've said, you don't want to know. And that's a, that's, a, that's it sounds funny, but that's a real issue now because investigators are being... And, and the lawyers they work for yeah. who do things that are improper are getting... Like that guy down in LA. Exactly. Yeah. Pelicano. Whatever his name was. Pelicano worked for a, a big firm, the Greenberg-Lusker firm. Yeah. And their issues are rising there. I mean, um, so I ask more questions of my investigators now, but uh, it, the, gone are the days when they might theoretically make a payment to somebody to get information. So how they do it now, I mean, I've had... I still don't have an investigator I work with regularly. Uh, too many of them are kind of stuck with giving you it, public records that you could find yourself. Yeah. So finding a good one is not that easy, but that's kind of what you're stuck with. Well, have you recently had an investigator who could actually find a bank account? I'm waiting for, for one. you didn't know about? Call me in a week and I will let you know. Well, somebody's working right now. Yeah, yeah. Somebody was recommended to me. Oh, wow. I had a, a very good one who has moved out of state and is not that accessible now. But, uh, you know, seriously, give me a call and let me know. By the way, so I don't forget, uh, I, I put a couple of sign-up sheets up here. If anybody wants to get my email bulletins on creditors' rights and bankruptcy, just give me your email address. I'd be happy to put you on the list.